Learning chemistry shouldn't be hot and greasy. It should be easy peasy. The Chem OG. Welcome back to the Chem OG. Today we're going to talk about resonance. And before we talk about resonance, let's figure out where the word comes from. So as a root word, S-O-N means sound. And so resonance means that we have something that's kind of going back and forth, kind of like a sound and an echo. And in particular, what we're going to talk about is the movement of electrons. But before we get into more details, there's something that you should know. And that is that stable things are not charged. Stable things are generally neutral. So a plus charge attracts a minus charge. That involves a change. And as we learned from another module, that means that we are reactive. And the opposite is true too if we flip the signs, right? A minus charge attracts a positive charge. And so that is a type of change as well. But neutral things aren't attracted to each other. They're neutral and that helps to stabilize them. And so the idea behind resonance is to be able to be a stabilizing force for our molecule. Okay, and resonance helps a molecule to become more neutral by moving electrons around. Now, electrons are the only things that are allowed to move around if we're going to call something a resonance feature. So if atoms move around, that's no longer resonance, that's something else. And so in order to move things around, you have to have a place for them. Right? So when people move from one part of town to the other, one part of the country to the other, they need a place to stay. And if you're going to move electrons around in order to stabilize your molecule, you need a place for them to stay. And the hotel room for electrons is an empty orbital. So when we talk about electrons in particular, electrons stay in empty orbitals. If you don't have an empty orbital for them, they're not going to move around because, as you know, electrons repel each other. And so what's an empty orbital exactly? How can you spot an empty orbital? In total, and in particular, we're going to talk about organic molecules. In total, there are three p orbitals. And so whichever p orbitals are not used or are unoccupied, those are the ones that are considered empty. So if we're talking about an sp hybridized atom, and we'll talk about hybridization separately, but an sp hybridized atom by definition uses an s orbital and a p orbital in order to accommodate its electrons. So if we're looking at sp hybridization, that means that we have one p orbital that's getting used and so the other two out of the three p orbitals are empty so the fact that we have two empty orbitals means that resonance is a possibility with sp2 hybridization we're using up two p orbitals so that means that one out of the three is empty so resonance is a possibility there too but for sp3 hybridization because it's sp3 it means we're using all three of the p orbitals. And if we are using all three of the p orbitals, that means that none of them are empty. And that's a problem for resonance, okay? So since resonance needs an empty p orbital, there is no resonance possible with sp3 atoms. So how do you spot when resonance is a possibility besides taking a look at the hybridization of orbitals? What you wanna do is you wanna look for lone pairs and or charge. So charge could be plus, could be minus. And when you have lone pairs or charge, those can move around from atom to atom only if the adjacent atom is participating in a pi bond. And that adjacent atom part is actually quite important because it needs to be a bond that's, or it needs to be an atom that's next door that's participating in a pi bond. It can't be the same atom that you're in right now. Because after all, you need a place to put those electrons. So the idea behind the movement, again, and I'll remind you, is to keep things as neutral as possible. So let's take a look at an example. If I take a look at nitrate, which is NO3 minus, the way that the structure for nitrate might look like at a given point is something that looks like this, where you have a negative charge on an oxygen here, you have a negative charge on an oxygen here, and a positive charge on this nitrogen for an overall charge of negative one. Now, remember we said that having a charge is a bad deal. So right now I have a negative charge on the oxygen on the right, negative charge on the oxygen on the left, but the oxygen on top is in a very good situation because it's currently neutral. So what I can do is I can switch around or move those electrons around that are currently on the negatively charged oxygens. And we do those with curved arrows. So I can move one of the lone pairs on this oxygen over and that'll make a new pi bond here. But that also means that these pi electrons are going to need to move up to the oxygen, and we're going to indicate that with a curved arrow that way. 
So the resulting structure is going to have an extra electron on the oxygen, and it's going to have a new double bond over here. And so the resulting structure is going to look like this. So now I still have negative charges on auctions. I got a negative charge on the one on top, a negative charge on the left, but I've solved the problem for the auction on the right. So what else can happen? Well, this oxygen has a negative charge here and here, but maybe if I remove one of these lone pairs of electrons and move them over, right, and make a new pi bond there, I can push these pi electrons over to the auction over here, and that'll create a negative charge on that auction. And so I end up with a third possibility for the nitrate ion. So you notice that in each of these structures, one of the auctions takes turns being the neutral one, and then the two others are going to carry a negative charge. And so the negative charge never totally resides on any one of the auctions. It kind of hops around. And the fact that I can prevent even marginally the negative charge from residing totally on any one auction, I can distribute it among all three. That means that I have a possibility of getting or nudging myself a little bit closer to neutral, and that helps to stabilize my molecule. And so when we talk about resonance possibilities. In the example that we saw, we saw pretty equivalent oxygen atoms, but you won't always have that case. And so when you're taking a look at resonance rules, there's a, there's a couple that you want to keep in mind. And these are in order of hierarchy. So the first and most important rule is that if you add up all the charges on all of your atoms, that must equal the overall charge on the molecule. There's no exception here. And so especially when you have uh, standardized exams that might have answer choices, taking a look at this first particular rule is a good, efficient way of being able to eliminate bad answer choices. So the overall charge in your molecule has to equal the sum of the charges on the individual atoms. Especially for organic molecules, you want to pay attention to the octet rule, or in other words, having eight valence electrons around carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. The reason I'm only including those four atoms is because those are the ones that you really, really want to adhere to the octet rule for. Now, other atoms, like for example, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and so on, they don't necessarily have to have eight electrons around them. Sometimes they have a few more than that. But in terms of a hard and fast octet rule, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, those are ones that you want to pay special attention to. Now, if you have a whole bunch of choices, the best resonance contributor, if you can find it, has formal charges that are close to zero, as close to zero as possible. So again, that leads into that main theme of the day today, and that is making sure that things stay as neutral as they can be. If you have to have a negative charge, put it on a more electronegative atom. And we'll talk about electronegativity in a separate module. If you have to have a positive charge, well, make it on the less electronegative atom instead. So that'll be your more or less your major resonance contributor. It's going to have one or combination of these characteristics here. So if we're talking about what we learned today, resonance is one way to help stabilize a molecule. And the more resonance possibilities that there are, the more stability that your molecule is going to have. Now, the best stability is having no charge whatsoever. So if you can avoid it, please have no charge. And resonance is one of many stabilizers. And remember what the big stabilizers are. So the mnemonic that you should remember is rays. So R is resonance, A is aromaticity, I is induction, size is electronegativity. So keep learning onward and upward. And as always, you're welcome.